Let's continue with our um, financial statement analysis videos. Um, we'll start off here talking about debt management, or we're going to measure solvency. Now, is, is a lot of debt bad? And that's really kind of the place where I think some people get off track, right? Having debt is not bad. Having enough debt that you have trouble paying for the debt, that is bad. So we want to ask two questions when you think about borrowing money or looking at the solvency of a company. The first is, how much debt do you have? We have two ratios that will cover that. And then the second question is, can you handle the amount of debt that you do have? So let's look at the first uh, of the ratios, which we're going to refer to as the debt ratio, DR, debt ratio, total debt divided by total assets. If you kind of think about a balance sheet, right, here are all the assets over here. We talked about that is all the things we've purchased. And over here, we have debt and equity. So you just take this total number divided by that number. It tells us the percentage of assets purchased with debt, right? What percentage of the assets have been purchased by borrowing? The alternative to that is the percentage of assets that are owned by the shareholders, right? So this is a percentage. It's going to be somewhere less than 100%. The bigger the number, the greater the debt. Now, the debt equity ratio, and again, these ratios that we've been talking about in the last couple of videos, there are many different formulas for the ratios. As long as you're always using the same formula, you shouldn't have an issue. But analyzing the ratios, regardless of their formula, is always the same. So debt equity looks at the relationship. In this case, it only looks at the left-hand side. We've got current liabilities, and we've got long-term debt, and we have equity. So this ratio, the debt equity ratio, looks at the relationship between long-term borrowing and, of course, the long-term investments of the owners. So it is a relationship of the financing. Now, on this side of the coin, this number can be greater than 100%. The higher the number, the greater the amount of long-term financing the management has chosen over equity. So if we look here at, uh, again, this is Kroger, and you look across the board, you see that roughly they're around 75% of their assets have been purchased by borrowing. But now the next question is, relatively speaking, how much of that debt was long-term compared to getting from their owners? And again, if you see here, they're all over 100%. And over, in fact, the, the most recent year here, 153%. So if debt was 1,000, they would have roughly 1,500 in long-term debt. It's about 153% of what the equity is. Again, the bigger the numbers, the greater the risk there is to the company. Now, the second question is all about how much do you have? And we have several ratios we can use, but the one that's talked about most frequently is the TIE ratio. This is times interest earned. It's just EBIT, or the operating income, divided by interest. And as you can see here, we certainly want it to be greater than one. Anything less than one would imply that we have um, negative income. And as we also know from the current changes in the tax code, the interest expense cannot be more than 30% of EBIT. So again, this number has... Uh, will probably change over the next several years and the patterns that we see because of the change in that tax code, or that part of the tax code. 
But again, you can see here the most recent year, it's much lower than the other years. So the idea here is we have around six and a half times more profit to cover interest. Now the number is down. Why is it down? Well, there's only two reasons why it could be down. Either interest is up or profits are down. So we need to investigate this to see what we're talking about as far as debt. If we go back to this other slide, we can see that really debt has not been increasing. So you wouldn't think that the reason this number went down was because of increasing interest. It must be, they must be having some issues in profitability. And we'll talk about that uh, a little bit later maybe. So again, let's now move on to the next set of ratios, which is that profit question. Gross profit margin looks at how do we control the expenses of production? How well do we do on that side? We take the gross profit divided by sales. Operating profit looks at all operations. all operations. How do we control those expenses? If you're a manager of the company, you're interested in these two numbers. If you're on the production line, this is the number you want to look at because this tells us how well you're controlling the expenses of production. Further upstream in the, in the management uh, line, you'd be more interested in all operations because you have more uh, control over those kinds of things. So as we look here, we can see there's three ratios. Of course, net profit margin is the bottom line. You see the numbers are fairly close. We know something weird kind of happened in this first year with net profit margin. I'm not sure why it was so low that year. Again, hopefully back then we looked at it and uh, apparently we fixed it because it went from 3% to 20%. So, but now if you look at it, the lines are pretty stable. Around 60% of, of every dollar goes to products. About, again, if you look at the orange line here, 26%, uh, that must mean 24%, or excuse me, 74% of all expenses go to uh, are from dollars, right? Go to covering the company, which means there's only 26% left to cover things like interest, taxes, and any other extraneous kinds of expenses we might have. And the bottom line, you see it's around 25.7%. Uh, so again, we can see what? That certainly over the last four years, Profitability from the income statement perspective has been very stable. What about from the balance sheet perspective? We want to make comparisons between income and assets and income and shareholder investment. So these two ratios show a relationship between profitability and total assets. So let's talk about ROA first. Sometimes this is also called return on investment. But this is net income divided by total assets. Since it's a bottom line number, right, this includes financing for the company. BEP is earnings, uh, uh, excuse me, operating income divided by total assets. So this has no financing impact. There's no financing affecting that ratio. So if our company has a very steady debt structure and policy with debt, and if you look at our, if you remember our previous slides on debt, it appears that we're pretty steady, fairly stable with how we finance our assets then we could use ROA just as easily as we use BEP. They'll be very similar because there's no big difference in financing. But if I wanted to compare, in this case, Coca-Cola to Pepsi, 
now I have a problem because Pepsi could have a vastly different financial structure. Now, if you look down here, here we have our numbers. BEP is blue. ROA is, is gray. And you see, they are almost identical, right? Why are they so identical? Yes, because there's not that much difference between the financing between the two companies. Uh, between uh, the years going across the line. And again, you see it's fairly steady, around the 10% range. Now, if you look at return on equity, we see the what? There is some growth going on here with the profit that goes to owners, right? So we're seeing that there's more profit given the dollars invested by the equity of the company. So down here, we see ROE, right now is in the 39% range, which is a very, very big number if you think about profitability. So we've looked at profitability from perspective of the income statement and then from the perspective of the balance sheet. So if we hold assets constant and debt increases, what happens to ROA and ROE? Well, ROA goes down. If debt goes up, ROA is going to go down because interest is included in, in the calculation of, of this income. Now, ROE can either increase or decrease because we really don't know the relationship. How much, uh, how much different is did uh, uh, equity decline in order to get to... Um, uh, to get to this ratio. But in general, if you increase debt, you should see some kind of an increase in the returns to shareholders. So return on equity and shareholder wealth are correlated, but there is some issues, right? Obviously, ROE doesn't look at risk. It's just a plain accounting number. It doesn't really consider the amount of capital that's invested. So again, looking at, given this, we, we obviously want to take a much more inclusive uh, look at the ratios. So maybe we want to uh, explore EVA as a return or a true economic profit for, for our investors. So let's continue on. The last set of ratios to talk about are the market valuation ratios. And we really have two of those. The first is called the PE ratio. And the PE ratio measures the optimism of shareholders in their company's future prospects. And it is market capitalization divided by net income or easier uh, numbers to find share price divided by earnings per share. And you can see again, this a little jagged, so it's a little, I don't wanna say in, unstable because differences aren't that much, but you can also see that there is an upward slope. So from this graph, I, can, I would say it appears that the shareholders of Coca-Cola are optimistic about the company's future. They're willing to pay more for the profits that are earned. The other ratio to look here then is something called market valuation ratios, excuse me, is the market to book value ratio. Again, this reflects optimism of the shareholder, but now it compares the price to the accounting value of the firm rather than profits. And again, what you can see, this is a little bit more jagged, right? A little bit more uh, unstable, if you will. But you can definitely see that the number is well above one, which is what we would hope if managers are doing what we want them to do. So the most recent years, again, we're around 10 and a half times. So what this means is that if you wanted to create a company that looked just like Coca-Cola, there's only two ways to do that. You either build a company that looks just like Coca-Cola with its same assets. Again, that's the book value of the company. Or you can buy the Coca-Cola outright by paying the market price. In this case, it's saying buying the stock is a lot more expensive than um, 
building the company. So what does this tell us? Again, P-E ratio. How much are investors willing to pay to get a dollar of profits? Market to book value ratio. How much investors are willing to pay for a dollar of equity? For each ratio, the higher the number, the better. And again, typically when these numbers are high, it, 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 it implies optimism on the behalf of the investor. Why are they optimistic? They are optimistic because either they sense high growth or they expect that the company has relatively low risk. Another ratio to look at is what's referred to as the enterprise multiplier. Again, this just looks at a different part of value and it's really kind of a cash flow number. Enterprise value is the market value of equity plus the market value of debt minus cash. So the enterprise value basically says, what would it cost to buy the company, pay off all the debt, and have a company now that has zero debt? That's the enterprise value. So essentially, what would it cost to buy the entire company and go to zero debt? Divide that by the cash flow number, EBITDA. And again, what we see here is that the number is increasing. It's moving in an upward direction, which is saying that in general, the value of this company is growing. So I hope you uh, liked that video. Uh, we'll come back with another video here in a couple of minutes. Look forward to seeing you soon.